Okay, I'm just going to read the back of the book. It is a great one. Neil Anderson comes from a humble farming background. No one suspected that this fun-loving athletic child would complete five degrees, author or co-author 60 books, and found a global ministry. The founder, President Emeritus of Freedom in Christ Ministries is back. It's almost a miracle because when he was with us last time, you were turning 70 and you said, I told my wife I'm coming off the road. I turned 70. Do I look older? <laughs> no, you don't. And reading your memoir, Rough Road to Freedom, I realize how much good stuff we've missed mm. just in your growing up story. But let me just say, for people who might be meeting you for the first time, uh, l just a couple of hooks. Uh, if you've done the Steps to Freedom in Christ, seven Steps to Freedom in Christ, first brought to our attention in The Bondage Breaker, but Victory Over the Darkness was an equal bestseller. And, you know, somewhere in this book, you talk about fridges all over the world having some form, probably a nicer version, of my identity in Christ. Nice laminated bookmark or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, Neil. I went to my fridge, and yes, it was on my fridge. <laughs> but this is a handout from a church service in 2005. You have impacted the body of Christ globally. And I'm, I'm trying not to gush. I know I did the last time you were here. I actually got in trouble for it. <laughs> um, but I'm just saying in as cerebral uh, a way as I can that we owe you so much. Thank you for going the extra mile. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, uh, it wasn't like I um, planned something out here. I said, God kept pushing me that extra mile. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's really kind of interesting because I remember back when I was a pastor and I kind of told the people, I said, listen, if we can explain everything that happened this year on the basis of hard work and human ingenuity, then where's God? Something's going to happen this year that you can't explain apart from the fact that there's God in it. And I wanted that to be true in my life. I said, you cannot explain that guy apart from the fact that there's a God living in him, and <laughs> which is true of every believer, of course. That way God gets the glory. You talked about uh, your farm life growing up a little bit when you were here last time, but oh, it's movie material, Dr. Anderson. Your dad, your dad being born cost the life of his mother. Mm -hmm. And his dad, I don't think ever forgave him that. Your mother lost her mother when she was just a nine-year-old girl. These are just some of the foundational things. Help us build a picture here. Well, it's interesting because I was born on a farm that my dad was born on. Actually, the same great aunt for me, a midwife, delivered both of us. And, um, and my brother and sister, older brother and sister, were born on a farm as well. Uh, it's, it's an interesting heritage. I actually walked a mile of country school that my grandfather built. It's sad when I look back because everything around me said grandfather. He built most of the buildings. He was actually more of a carpenter than he was a, a farmer. And, uh, and yet I never knew for years afterwards because dad never talked about him, never mentioned him. First time he did, dad was 75 years old and he said, that man. And I realized, I said, all those years that bitterness was there. He was shipped off when he was born because his, his mother died, my real grandmother, uh, at his birth. And he was shipped down to Iowa and was raised by a grandfather and an uncle. And all he knew was Norwegian. And then when my grandfather remarried, he came back and went to that country school my grandfather built, but had to learn English at that time. And uh, <clears throat> so life was a hardship. And then dad had polio. Mm. And one leg shriveled up. Later on, he would lose that leg in a farm accident, which had a great impact on me as well. But I don't look back more and, and look at that life as saying, gee, it was really hard. In one way, it was physically hard. I mean, you know, we didn't have heat upstairs in our house, and this is in Minnesota. <laughs> we scraped frost off the inside of our wall in the wintertime. You talk about a hot water bottle <laughs> being left outside the bed, and it froze solid, it froze solid on overnight. the bed. It froze solid. And, uh, uh, and yet I look back at my childhood. It was nothing but 4-H and church. I got a little pin as I went to Sunday school for nine straight years. Uh, Unfortunately, during that time, I never came to Christ. I mean, I'm thankful for the Bible stories. I'm thankful. I never once had a moment in my life when I didn't believe that there was a God. And, but I didn't really come to know Him until many years later. And uh, 
I, uh, I thought I was going to be a farmer. I wanted to be a farmer. Then they sold the family farm when I was in high school. Oops. And I said, oops, now what am I going to do? And uh, I just didn't have any real motivation, no direction in my life. So I went in the Navy. And uh, I think it's there you discovered you had a real strong left brain. <laughs> well, you know, I was kind of the unofficial athletic officer aboard the ship. And listen, and so I got involved in that. But you, you, you got in electronics. Got, you know, I was seeing rescue swimmers. So I mean, had all the, I I was this kind of guy. I said, I want to do everything. I was going to say you were a do 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 guy and a Greco Roman wrestler. I had to bring this, you know, taking wrestling away from the Olympics is going to kill all those dreams, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world. You must have heard about this. How do you feel about it? Terrible. And they left ping pong for crying out loud. I mean, I mean, you know, that was one of the earliest sports ever. Uh, that had an impact on me too, because when I was in the Navy, I, uh, I, I uh, saw that Long Beach was offering an, an AAU tournament on Greco-Roman wrestling. Actually, I never wrestled Greco-Roman. I was collegiate freestyle, and Greco-Roman is a little different style of wrestling. And boy, it is work. It, in those days, they had two five-minute periods. And, oh, Lord, you don't know how much you exert energy-wise to, uh, to go five minutes a period, take a little break, and do it again. Well, what happened was I tore up my knee. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd advanced to the finals, and uh, I tore up my knee, and I, I went back and showered, and uh, come back, watch the heavyweights wrestle, and my leg just stiffened. <laughs> As I was in the Navy at that time, and they took me over to the hospital ship, USS Hope, an old hospital ship that probably no longer exists, and um, pediatrician was on duty. He didn't know what to do with it, so <laughs> he just tried to straighten it out, then he put a cast on it. Three days later, we left for Japan on board that ship. Try getting around a destroyer with your cast from your ankle to your hip. But you're so determined you continue to pitch for baseball and do other athletic involvements. So. Well, you know, but I got out, I knew there was something wrong. And, uh, and so the VA uh, did my surgery and, and uh, uh, you know, getting out of the service, realizing I needed to get back to college. And I went through four years of engineering school and two and a half. And uh, I got married. My wife helped me get through. She supported you through she that. She supported me through that. And uh, so I went back to my beloved Minnesota. And I thought, gee, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And that was exciting because we worked on the Apollo space program. Our company had the guidance system for the lunar lander. Wow. So that was neat. But my wife <clears throat> was raised Lutheran in Minnesota. Had switched to Catholicism. I was a Methodist. Didn't want to be a Catholic at the time. So we compromised and became Episcopalians. And then we found the Lord. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, wow. <clears throat> and I look back, it was kind of painful to realize you played church all those years. And a lot of people had. I, I came from a state that has a lot of religious non-believers. We go to church as part of our culture. And that's true kind of around the world. There's a lot of people who gravitate to kind of a religious orientation because it's part of the culture. But discovering, you know, a personal relationship with God was almost immediately life transforming for me. And then I got transferred out of my beloved Minnesota to California, which you wouldn't think would be a good spiritual move, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know what people think of Southern California. They think God rotated the whole world west one night and everything that was loose rolled to Southern California. <laughs> well, to me it was. He took me out of my comfort zone again, got involved in the Episcopal Church. No reflection really on them. This particular priest, however, was apostate. And a good Baptist friend of mine said, why don't you try our church? And, and to me, it was all new. Uh, bookstores came out of nowhere, periodicals I'd never seen before. That Baptist church that you went to was a whole new world for you. It really honestly was. I mean, all of a sudden I was, you know, being taught scripture, being taught, you know, the need Coming to make alive. decisions. And two years later, God called me out of that to uh, go to seminary. Let me just say about this early history, actually all of your history in the world of the church, mm -hmm. that... You share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, we don't always do it well. We don't always treat each other well. You ran into all kinds of things. The way you chose to handle those things is a schoolroom for all of us. Whether you're in leadership in the church or not, I think we all need to uh, take that journey with you. For, just as an example, no bad-mouthing the pastor. Just speak to that. Well, uh, that was a tough experience. I mean, I, I'd left engineering, I was going to seminary and getting all this kind of idealism. And I was in the pastor, the church was, pastor was a real go-getter. And um, I went and played golf one day with the music director. 
And I said, what do you think of the pastor? I was kind of impressed with him at the time. And uh, he said, frankly, I can't stand the man. For 18 holes, I heard every little character defect he had. And it poisoned me. Uh, I, I was so angry at him after a year. And then the concept of that I'm supposed to love everybody. I mean, it was just a dire conflict in my life. And I told my wife, I'm going to go see the pastor. You are? And I said, uh, I sat down. I said, you know, I, I need to ask your forgiveness for not loving you. At least three times in your journey, you go to someone <laughs> and say, I'm sorry, I haven't loved you. <laughs> That's very courageous. Well, you know, and finally I learned to love people. <laughs> I mean, that was, uh, you know, and the, the easy argument at the time was, was that they didn't deserve my love. And I said, nobody deserves our love. I mean, we don't deserve God's love. God loves us because God is love. It's his nature to love us. And that's what he wants us to be like. But, it, but I had to be honest about those issues in my life because that's part of our growth process. Mm. I, I said, you, you can't, <clears throat> the only thing I can model, Myra, is my growth. I can't model perfection. It doesn't belong to God. It only belongs to God, I'm sorry. Uh, the only thing we can model is growth. And if I can't own up to my own mistakes, uh, you know, then I've, I've modeled something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how am I supposed to act? It's not an act. It's a real life. And it's one that God has to take us, you know, through periods of brokenness in our life to, to make us the people that he wants us to be. Dr. Anderson's real life is a learning curve. It will definitely enrich your spiritual growth. And I'm so thrilled that we have... Dr. Anderson and the book for three days, three very special days.